Every year, I like to have my students build hot air balloons out of tissue paper. In this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about the science behind how hot air balloons fly. Or to put it more accurately, how hot air balloons float. They don't really fly in a technical sense. So in order to get an idea of how hot air balloons float through the sky, we need to first look at floating in general. Why do some things float and some things sink? When you put something in water, like say a beach ball, if you press down on it, you can feel the water pressing back up on you. That's called a buoyant force. The water in the pool exerts an upward force that's acting in opposition to the weight of the object or any additional forces like you pushing. And so whether something floats or sinks, it's really determined by just two things, those two forces, the buoyant force upwards and the weight or additional force downward. Now we're talking about floating, so we're going to ignore any additional forces. Basically, if the buoyant force is greater than the weight of the object, then the object will float. If the buoyant force is less than the weight, then the object sinks. If you've ever put a beach ball in the water, then you've realized that as you try to force it down below, the buoyant force actually gets stronger. So unlike weight, buoyant force changes as an object is submerged. The strength of the buoyant force on an object depends on how much of the object you have underwater. In the 3rd century BC, a Greek mathematician named Archimedes realized that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by an object. Archimedes was a great mathematician and an engineer, and he basically made this discovery in the bathtub. He realized that as he sat in the tub, he was pushing water out of the way. And if, had been, if his body had been made out of something different, like say a rock, it would have pushed just as much water out of the way. So the buoyant force is caused by the amount of water that you push out of the way. The buoyant force in the case of the beach ball increases as you submerge more and more of the ball because you're pushing more and more water out of its former position. So what you really need to compare to see if something will float is the ratio of the weight to volume for the object and for the fluid. In other words, if the weight to volume ratio of the object is greater than the weight to volume ratio than the fluid, the object will sink. On the other hand, if the weight to volume ratio of the object is less than the weight and to volume ratio of the fluid that you have displaced, then the object will float. Think for a moment if you had a pool of water. Imagine that you had a sphere of water somehow um, being held together all by itself, that water would weigh something. Now, if you replace that sphere with an equal sized object, it would also weigh something. The submerged object would feel a buoyant force equal to an amount of weight of the water that had been displaced. 
This is called Archimedes' principle. The ratio of weight to volume in more modern terms is technically called density and instead of weight we use mass because that doesn't involve gravity. And so if you had three objects here and you submerge them all underwater and they're all the same size then they've all pushed the same amount of water out of the way. If they're all the same size but they have three different masses then they have three different densities. Seeing as they push the same amount of water out of the way in all three cases, the buoyant force on all three is the same. But the density of each of these objects is different. If you did a density calculation for both the water and for each object, then the denominators where you have volume would be the same, but the mass would be different. And so what we really need to know in this case is how much does each of these things weigh? So if you push three objects completely underwater, they all experience the same buoyant force because they displace the same weight of water. I'll represent that with three upward vector arrows here in red. They're all three the same size because it's the same buoyant force. But their weights are different, They're represented by the blue vector arrows downward. The cork doesn't weigh very much, so its arrow is relatively small. The aluminum weighs more, and then the lead weighs even more, so its arrow is correspondingly bigger. If the submerged body's weight is greater than the buoyant force, in other words, if the blue arrow is bigger than the red arrow, then the object will sink all the way to the bottom. On the other hand, if the submerged body's weight is less than the buoyant force upward, it will rise to the top. Scientists have made um, all kinds of density measurements, and so in order to know whether something will float or sink, if it's a pure substance, it's relatively easy. It's just a matter of looking up the densities and comparing. If the object's density is greater than water, which is 1.0000 grams per cubic centimeter at 4 degrees Celsius, then that object will sink. On the other hand, if its density is less than 1, it will float. Now I just showed an example where aluminum and lead were sinking. So how can you build something like this battleship out of metal and have it float? Well, one of the things you may not have noticed that I said is it has to be a pure substance. Battleships are not made out of just one thing. In fact, battleships have a lot of air in them. If you want to know if something will float or sink, you have to compare the overall density of the object and the fluid. In this case, we have a picture of two oranges, one with the peeling, one without. The one with the peeling floats, the one without sinks. That peeling has a lot of air incorporated into it, which gives it overall a density lower than that of water. So how can a metal ship float? It's because the ship is not solid. It has lots and lots of air inside of it. And consequently, if you take the entire mass of the ship divided by the entire volume of the ship, you'll get a ratio of less than one gram per cubic centimeter. In other words, this density is less than water. Seawater by the way, is slightly more dense than freshwater. So your ratio can um, be compared to a little bit less, well, greater than one gram per cubic centimeter. If the ship's weight is less than the buoyant force, it floats. So why would a ship sink if it gets a water leak? It's because 
the water is displacing some of the air and it weighs more than the air. So the weight of the ship, the numerator in the ratio, is getting bigger and bigger. And if that numerator gets greater than the density of the seawater, then the ship will sink. So what does this have to do with hot air balloons? Well, the principle of buoyancy applies to any fluid, anything that flows. Air is a fluid. In fact, if you think about it, we live at the bottom of a sea of air. There are miles and miles and miles of air on top of us. Being a fluid, we can compare the density of one object to the density of air. And if the density of the air is greater, then that object will float. So a hot air balloon can float if it can weigh less than the air displaces. Now that's hard to imagine because the balloon is made of something the envelope there in the case of a, say a modern hot air balloon might be made out of some sort of synthetic material or silk. It's also got a basket. It's got people. It's got fuel. It's got some sort of a, a heater propane uh, torch on it. So it seems like it would weigh a lot. How could it weigh less than air? Well, it's not that it weighs less than air. It's the ratio of the weight over the volume of air displaced. So in other words, if the balloon is simply full of air, regular air, then yeah, there's no way it's going to get off the ground. In order to get it to get off the ground, we have to somehow make it weigh less. Now, how can we make a big balloon like this weigh less than it would if it just had plain old air in it? especially seeing as it's got that big hole at the bottom. Well, the key is to understand how air moves. Air molecules are, are individually uh, moving around very rapidly. I mean, your average oxygen or nitrogen molecules are moving at an average speed of about a thousand miles an hour. But if you heat them up, they move even faster. And consequently, they can, they can spread apart, and that means their density gets lower. Or another way to say it is, there's fewer molecules in a given amount of space, and so there's less of a weight in a given amount of space. So here we have a hot air balloon, and if you look at the inset there, the blue area, shows the air molecules on the inside, which are hot, versus the air molecules on the outside, which are cooler, there are fewer air molecules inside. And as you heat the balloon, even more of those air molecules can escape. Having fewer air molecules inside than it would be at a regular temperature or a cold temperature, means that it must weigh less than it used to. It becomes less and less dense overall. If you can have less density of the overall space of the balloon, then the amount of air that it's pushing out of the way, then this balloon will float. So balloons can go up until the weight of the displaced air equals the total weight of the balloon. At that point, it would not rise any further. If at any point it weighs more than the surrounding air, it's going to sink. Now again, I, I use the word weight, but you have to remember what I, I'm trying to emphasize is how much air in the same amount of space would weigh. So we're always really comparing the density if the density of the balloon is less than the density of the air, then it can float. If it's the same, then it will still float. It won't go up or down. It can be pushed around by the wind, I suppose. If, it, if the density of the balloon is greater, then it will sink. 
So the rule of floating or Archimedes principle is relatively simple. Whenever an object is less dense than the surrounding fluid, it will float. Now, just to go off on a tangent for a little while here, this rule applies for all fluids. In other words, it applies to all gases and all liquids. So imagine you're uh, looking out your back window on a sunny day and you see something like this. A big cloud is forming. What's really going on here is a density thing. The air is warmed near the ground. As a consequence, it's less dense than the surrounding air and that less dense air rises. It's not inside of a, a synthetic material envelope, but a bubble of air can rise just like the hot air balloon can. And so you get this rising air. There's some, several other things going on here, including that as it rises, it's losing energy because it's fighting the force of gravity. And so it gets cooler. As it gets cooler, that means the air molecules get closer together. In other words, they start to become more dense. If they get more dense than the surrounding air, then that air sinks. So basically, this uh, cumulonimbus cloud here is uh, a big cycle of convection, we call it, where we have rising air in the middle and sinking air around the edges. It's all because of density. It not only happens on a local scale, making small clouds, it happens on a global scale. If you think about the entire Earth, the warmest parts of the Earth are near the equator. That means that's where warm air is. That air is less dense than air, um, say, further up north. And so you've got basically on a global scale, rising less dense air it's being floating up near the equator, but it cools and then it sinks higher in latitude, say around 30 degrees. So there are other cells that go between about 30 and, and 60 degrees and even about 60 and 90. But if you think about it, each of those lower latitudes for at least most of the year will have warmer temperatures on average than the higher latitudes. And so the less dense air will rise up and move toward those cooler, more dense regions, whereas the cooler air sinks down and pushes into where the warm air used to be. So density differences in the air are a large part of what causes our weather and our climates. You've no doubt noticed that helium balloons can float. Why is that? Well, it turns out the helium molecule is much smaller than the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen in the air, and consequently it moves faster. This faster motion allows it to spread out further and therefore have fewer molecules in a given amount of space. If you have fewer molecules, which are already very small, then that means you have lower density. Helium is over seven times less dense than air. And so the air pushes the helium balloon up. Fluids include both liquids and gases, and the principle of buoyancy applies to both. So if you have something like this soda pop here, you might notice there are bubbles in it and they rise to the top. That's because the density of the gas bubbles is less than the density of the surrounding liquid. So the density of the gas bubbles means that they will float. They rise up. We see it as a rising motion, but in fact, they're floating. You know, if you look at this picture for a moment, you'll also realize you see something else that's floating. Ice. Water has a very unusual property. At about 4 degrees Celsius, instead of getting more dense, as it gets colder, it actually starts to expand slightly. It expands about 10% between four degrees Celsius and zero degrees, where it freezes. Because it expands, 
That means there are fewer molecules in a given amount of space. In other words, its density is less than the surrounding water. And so ice uh, will float in water. Now, this applies no matter how big the ice is. It's not a matter of overall weight. It's the ratio of weight to volume. Seeing as ice is about 10% less dense than the surrounding water, one of the effects of that is that about 10% of the ice will stick up and 90% will be below the water. That 90% equals the weight of the water displaced. So you may have heard this saying, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And what that means is, is that if you're looking only at above the surface, then you're only seeing 10% of the problem. 90% of the problem is below uh, which, where you're looking. Usually when we think of fluids, we think of things like air and water. But even below the Earth's surface, there's molten rock. And if, just because it's rock doesn't mean that the rules don't apply. In fact, they do. So we have giant convection cycles going on underneath our feet. The core of the Earth is very, very hot. It heats up the rock and melts it. And that melted rock is less dense than the surrounding rock and rises up, just like warm air rising on a summer day. As it rises, it cools. And so that creates these big cycles of convection. A consequence of that, though, is that here on the top, where we have solid rock, we're getting pushed around. If you think about it, this molten rock is trying to rise just like a bubble in your soda pop and it's trying to get out. So there's a cap on top in this case, there's solid rock, but there are places where that molten rock can break through and it forms volcanoes. In the 1940s, when um, sonar and radar were being um, deployed by the armies that were fighting each other in World War II, they started to discover these underwater volcanic mountain ranges, and they spread all around the Earth. So this molten rock comes up and, and cools off in the seawater and forms these volcanoes underwater. And they do actually stick up above the ground, above the water, excuse me, in some places like, say, Iceland. And so um, these ridges, as these oceanic, mid-oceanic ridges, as they're called, are, like I said, found in all the different oceans all around the Earth in various places. And one of the interesting discoveries um, not long afterwards is that if you take samplings of the rocks near the volcano, of course, they're very young, but as you go further away, the rocks get progressively older. And so this, these older rocks, we think, must have been formed at that oceanic ridge at some point and pushed away. In other words, the plates, as they're called, the tectonic plates, are getting pushed around constantly because of this less dense molten rock rising up, cooling off, we now know of more than a dozen of these tectonic plates. Now, if you think about it, they can't all be growing because then the earth would be expanding like somebody blowing up a balloon. So in some places, the plates are moving apart where they're being formed at these mid oceanic ridges. But in other places, the plates are colliding. In some cases, they collide head on. And what has to happen there is one of them will get subsumed below the other. So which one goes down and which one goes up? It's a matter of density. The one that is more dense will sink and the one that's less dense will float up or rise. At least it'll stay above the other one. So one that has continental rock typically will be less dense than one that has only oceanic rock 
which tends to be a little bit denser. So if you have two plates collide and one's oceanic crust and one's got continental crust, the oceanic crust will go down. Now, a consequence of that is that it'll cause earthquakes. And also, as it goes down, it gets hot and it melts. And so we have that molten lava again, which tries to rise up and get out. And so you can get volcanoes. So let me circle around and talk about our original question, which is how hot air balloons fly or float. What you're going to see is that if you put hot air in a balloon, so here's a tissue paper balloon. This is a camp stove and it's got a pipe over it. And if you fill this up with hot air, if you can force out enough of the air molecules out the bottom, then the balloon will float. It'll keep rising until its density equals that of the surrounding air that it's displacing. And that as it continues to cool off, its density is going to increase, and so it's going to come back down. Now these things, usually uh, when we make them and we go outside on a spring day and fly them, they'll go maybe across the football field here, maybe 50, 60 feet high but occasionally they go even higher. A couple of years ago, I had one uh, that went so high, it was unbelievable. So in this picture, in the middle, you see an airplane. Well, in the upper right corner, you may not see it, but in that circle, there's a hot air balloon way up in that cloud. Do you see it? Isn't that crazy? It got caught in one of those convection cycles, it, uh, an updraft where there was warm air and it really wasn't floating so much that, at that point as it was getting pushed and it just kept going higher and higher until it went out of sight. There it is, right there. But there you have it. That's the science behind how hot air balloons fly. I hope our project goes well and that your balloons fly high.